Welcome to In the Public Interest, a podcast from Wilmer Hale. I'm John Walsh. And I'm Brendan McGuire. John and I are partners at Wilmer Hale, an international law firm that works at the intersection of government, technology, and business. In this episode, we are honored to be joined by Dewey Bazella, a former professional boxer and Wilmer Hale client who spent 26 years in prison for a crime he did not commit. We are also joined by two of the attorneys who worked tirelessly to establish Mr. Bazella's innocence and ultimately secured his freedom. Ross Fersenbaum, our partner here at Wilmer Hale, and Shauna Frieden, a former Wilmer Hale attorney who is now with American Express. Before handing it over to Ross and Shauna, let us tell you a bit about Dewey Bazella's story. Mr. Bazella endured a traumatic childhood. When he was eight years old, he witnessed his father beat his pregnant mother to death. When he was 16, one of his brothers was stabbed to death. Another brother was shot to death, and another brother died of AIDS. Mr. Bazella himself had trouble with the law at the age of 17, with arrests for theft and attempted robbery that landed him in jail for three years. Despite his troubles, Mr. Bazella was an up-and-coming boxer. In 1977, 92-year-old Emma Crasper was murdered in her apartment in Poughkeepsie, New York. Mr. Bazella was arrested for Ms. Crasper's murder shortly after her attack, but charges were dropped because there was no evidence linking him to the crime. Six years later, Mr. Bazella's nearly three-decade nightmare began when he was again arrested after two inmates told prosecutors that he had committed the murder. Based on their testimony alone, Mr. Bazella was convicted of murder and sentenced to 20 years to life. So in 1983, at the age of 23, Mr. Bazella arrived at Sing Sing Correctional Facility in New York to serve his sentence. During his incarceration, he picked up boxing again, earning the title of Sing Sing's light heavyweight champion. Also while in prison, Mr. Bazella met his wife Trina and earned a bachelor's degree and a master's in theology. Although Mr. Bazella was a model prisoner, he was denied parole multiple times because he refused to admit that he was guilty of the murder. Mr. Bazzilla was granted a new trial in 1990, but he was convicted again based on even less evidence than his first trial, because witnesses had recanted their testimony. Before trial, he was offered a deal that would have let him leave prison if he confessed to the crime, but he refused. Mr. Bazzilla eventually sought the help of the Innocence Project, but the physical evidence in the case had been destroyed. The Innocence Project then reached out to Wilmer Hale to handle the case. In 2009, based on exculpatory evidence that lawyers at Wilmer Hale discovered had never been turned over from prosecutors to Mr. Bazella, including a fingerprint at the scene of the crime that matched another individual who committed a nearly identical crime around the same time, a judge ruled that Mr. Bazella should have a new trial. The Dutchess County District Attorney's Office declined to retry Mr. Bazella for a third time after an assistant district attorney announced in open court that the prosecution did not have any evidence available to retry him. On October 28, 2009, Mr. Bazella was finally released from prison. Upon being released after 26 years, Mr. Bazella's dream was to fight as a professional boxer. On October 15, 2011, Mr. Bazella's dream was realized when he fought in his first and only professional fight at the Staples Center in Los Angeles in front of his wife and friends, as well as the Wilmer Hale attorneys who fought for his freedom. Former President Obama even called Mr. Bazella before his fight just to wish him luck. Mr. Bazella won by unanimous decision. Mr. Bazella's story of courage and perseverance has inspired millions across the country. On July 13, 2011, Mr. Bazella was honored at ESPN's annual ESPY Award Show as the recipient of the Arthur Ashe Courage Award. And in March 2012, ESPN aired a 60-minute documentary entitled 26 Years, The Dewey Bazella Story, which chronicled Mr. Bazella's quest to earn his freedom and pursuit of his single dream to fight a professional boxing match as a free man. Mr. Bazella's story is both tragic and inspiring, and we're delighted to have him on our podcast. With that, I'll pass it over to Ross and to Shauna. Thanks so much. And Dewey and Shauna, thank you both for being here. Dewey, when Miss Crapser was murdered in 1977, the police focus their investigation almost immediately on you. Why do you think that happened? I was hanging out with the wrong crowd, put me in a a situation like that. And when you say you were hanging out with the wrong crowd, who were you hanging out with at the time? Well, I was hanging out with a bunch of other guys in the park. I was just, you know, getting familiar. Got to be reminding me of New York City when I went into Madison Square Park. And some of the things I did when I was young, 
And so I just got involved with it. And next thing I know, I'm arrested for the crime of murder. Did you have the sense that race played any role in the fact that the police were pointing their finger at you and trying to pin this on you? At first, I really ignored it. I didn't think, I thought it was a joke. You know, I said, no, they got the wrong man. But as time went along, they became very serious about it. And they came after me strong to where the police kept harassing me and messing with me, whatever I was doing, whatever. And it just became monotonous. Why I didn't know what the heck to do. I was like, come on, you got to be kidding me. And then next thing I know, I was arrested for the crime of murder, Ms. Jane Crashford. I was like, you've got to be kidding me. I, I, didn't, I, didn't, I didn't kill no old woman. Nothing pointed to me at all. Nothing showed me at the scene of the crime. Nothing informed evidence, nothing at all pointed me to the nature of the crime, even to the fact where when they arrested me, I was supposed to be in hold only for three days, and they kept me for 28 days where the judge uh, told them they had to let me go. Now, let me, let me explain something. I do not say or believe that all police officers are bad. That's not true. Like anything else in life, it's the few that make it look bad for the men. That's what's going on with me. It's the few. I realized that there's a lot of police officers that are good. I have ran into them. I've talked to them, sat down with them. So, you know, I just feel that, you know, when it comes down to the law, the law, the law, that's when you have your difficulty at. But once you're in, it's hard as heck to get out. Jumping ahead all the way to the present, you're now in the Atlanta, Georgia area, and you're starting to do volunteer work with kids who are in juvenile detention. How do you take how your experience from the time sort of hanging out with the wrong kids that sort of led to all of this? How do you incorporate that into the message that you give to the kids in the Atlanta area who are in juvenile detention? The first thing is I give them this honesty. I don't try to sugarcoat anything. I just let them know that, hey, these are the mistakes that you can make. The first mistake I made was hanging out with the wrong crowd. This is the reason why I was arrested for a crime in 1977, and it took me over 32 years to prove my innocence. The second mistake I made was uh, getting high, um, which is smoking reefer and drinking. And the third mistake was just being around them. And stage by stage, the police were looking and without me realizing it. And next thing I know, you know, I'm involved in a murder. And so I try to implement things like that to let them see that you don't have to do that if you have something that you can put yourself involved into by learning how to get a trade, learning how to be involved with different types of things. When I got involved in a program that helped me to learn about carpentry, it put me on another level. I didn't have education, but this is what you can do. Learn to take advantage of your situation where you're at right now, because if you don't have nothing left to offer to society, society has nothing to offer to you. After you were arrested, as you said, you were released. They didn't have any evidence on you. That was 1977. And then six years went by until 1983, until the case picked up again. What was going on during that time in your life? Well, the first thing I started doing is I realized, hold up, wait a minute. It's street life. It's not doing anything for me. So the first thing I went and I did is I went back to going to school. And I got into school with a Dutch community college where I can get my GED and at the same time, received college credits. And so I went and I got my GED in 1983. But the whole thing was, during that time, I was going to school. I was going to Floyd Passion Boxing Camp. And I also got in the Poughkeepsie Journal for going to Dutch Community College and playing the baseball team. And so, you know, I knew I had the potential. And I knew that, you know, I was making changes in my life. Just soon I started making changes in my life, the case popped back up. Dewey, you were tried in 1983, and you heard the announcement from the jury finding you guilty. How do you react to a jury finding you guilty for the murder of a 92-year-old woman when you didn't commit that crime? I didn't understand the law, but I did understand being convicted for murder meant that I could receive life without no parole. So I, I actually fell down on the floor. And I told him, I didn't do it. I didn't do it. You got the wrong man. Seven women and five men just started breaking down crying. You know, I said, it's too late. It's too late. You can you convict me for a crime I didn't do. It's too late. And that's what I said, leaving out the courtroom. Because it was devastating. It was devastating. That was your first trial in 1983. You were 
retried in 1990, and your constitutional rights had been violated in that first trial because of Batson violations. Black jurors had been excluded from the jury. When you were retried again, the prosecutor's case was even weaker than it had been in 1983. There were witnesses who had recanted. During the time when the jury was deliberating, you received an offer from prosecutors that would have resulted in your immediate release. Take us through that. You refused to take a plea at that point, even though you would have been out. What was going through your mind and why did you decide not to do that? While I was in what they call Sing Sing Correctional Facility up in Austin, New York, I did six and a half years. And during that six and a half year period, in the beginning of, of my time, that let's get, you know, I'm going to be straight. And I was angry. And uh, there was a guy by the name of Sharif. He walked up to me and he said, yo, man, I need to, I need to talk to you, man, because you're fronting. And what he meant by that was, uh, you know, I'm being a person that I'm not. And then I asked myself one question. If they would let you out right now, this very moment, and they found out you didn't went to crime, what would your life be like? And then I asked myself, I answered the question by asking myself, you would be a bum. I didn't like that answer at all. Mm -hmm. I didn't have anything that made me feel good about myself in terms of what I needed to do. And that's when I understood what he was trying to tell me. I went and I got my GED. Then I went and I got my highly certificate in law. And then I went and I got 32 certificates. So when six and a half years passed by and I went to my second trial, I said, well, shoot, I can offer society something, you know, so when the deal came during the trial, they said, listen in, Mr. Bozak, we give you what we call manslaughter. You got six and a half years in, and we'll give you seven to 14. You'll see the parole board in six months. And I said, no, I'm not taking the deal. And then they came back with another deal. They said, here, listen here, Mr. Bozak, we give what we call time served. All you got to do is to tell us how you did the crime. You will go back to the same thing, correct the facility. And from there, you will be released. I said, no. No. So then as the jury was starting to come in, this attorney said, listen, Mr. Mozart, we get what we call a scenario of a plea. All you got to do is to sign a piece of paper and walk out the courtroom right now. And I looked and I said, no, I didn't do it. Because of that, when I said no, the jury found me guilty. Everything pointed to someone else. With not one string of shred of evidence pointed to me. I was like, you've got to be kidding me. So from that day forward, after I got to 20 years of life, I just like, you know, okay, all right, this is how it's going to be. If, it's, if they're waiting for me to tell them I did it, then I'm going to die in prison. So Dewey, you spent another 19 years in prison for having the courage to not admit to a crime that you didn't commit. What kept you going? The first thing I did is I became academically inclined. I just said to myself, you know what, I'll keep doing the things that I need to do to make myself a better person. During that time, for the next 19 years, I went and I got 52 certificates, three trades, a bachelor's degree in Bachelor of Science, and then I went and I got a master's degree in New York Theological Seminary in Professional Studies dealing with religion. And so this is what helped me to better myself, and not only better myself, I was also teaching classes, and because me teaching classes, it helped me to prepare myself for everything I needed to do. But there was one time when I went to my first parole board, and after 20 years behind the prison walls, they wanted me to admit to the crime, which I couldn't do. So gave me two more years added on to my sentence. That's when I started realizing, you know, there's a possibility of me never going home because they wanted me to, to admit to the nature of the crime. And I said, I can't admit to something that I didn't do. While you were in front of the parole board, after Wilmer Hale took on your case, you were telling the parole board, look, there's this new evidence that wasn't disclosed to my lawyers that show I'm innocent. But because that piece was missing of acknowledgement of the crime, which you couldn't do because you didn't commit, you were denied. But at the same time, Donald Wise, whose fingerprint was at the scene of the Crapster murder and who had been in prison for a similar amount of time for another murder, he was released while you were still in prison. How, how did you react to that? <laughs> how could I? It was, uh, you know, I was, I was like, man, what is it going to take for me to get out of prison? You know, um, it's very difficult to be in a situation like that. I said, well, the first thing I had to do was find my peace. 
Mm-hmm. And the second thing I had to do was just find out what I want to do with my time. So this way, when the possibility does come, I have something to offer to society. And if it doesn't come out that way, then at least I can say I died trying to do something with my life on the inside. I think that what happened to you in parole and the contrast with Donald Wise is really, it's such a powerful illustration of a problem that continues to this day in the New York state parole system and likely elsewhere. There was powerful evidence showing that the prosecution's key witnesses were lying at your trial. And there was powerful evidence showing that someone else, the person whose fingerprint was found inside of Ms. Krapser's bathroom window, was committing the same exact crimes with the same specific MOs, both involving stuffing objects down the victim's throat. And yet, with all of that, evidence that the court ultimately said was, quote, compelling, indeed overwhelming, the parole board said, we don't care. You were still denied and had to serve another two years in prison until we were able to get the court to order your release. Let's talk a little bit about the litigation. We had presented all this evidence to the court, and the district attorney who was in office at the time of your prosecution, 1983, was still the district attorney in Dutchess County in 2009. They just ignored us at first for months, and then finally, when they responded, they just opposed everything we said and um, had no interest in cooperating or testing whether the claims that we had made were true and whether they had gotten the wrong guy. What did you make of that? What people need to understand is that if you don't admit to the nature of the crime, you're never going home. That's number one. Number two, when y'all put it in the document, Wilma Cutler Hale Law Firm put it in the document to actually show my innocence. And not only that, for me going to a psychologist to prove that I'm no threat to society, all the work that, that, that was done to show that I'm innocent was ignored, period. Because of that, I was on my way to my fifth parole board. So that means that was 10 more years added on to my sentence. I never made it because of what you're talking about right at this particular time. But what is persistent is the parole board keep denying me. And every time I was denied, there was another two years added on to my sentence. That was real reckoning. That was to, to the point where I just said, I already know they're not going to let me go home because the simple fact is that I will never tell them that I did it. So I made up my mind. This is where I'm going to die at, then so be it. And I meant that with all my heart. You know, it is what it is. My faith in the law system was horrible. It still is. They show you on national TV. They show you in the movies, and they show you in real life, you know. When they want you, they do what they got to do to get you, period. So when you, from a hell law firm, took it to the judge in 2009, you actually did something that was remarkable to where the judge said this is overwhelming evidence. Any one of the two trials has been a different verdict, and that's when I was found not guilty. After all of those disappointments with the parole board and the years and years you'd spent, how did it feel that day in the courtroom when your conviction was finally overturned? I couldn't believe it. I I sat there saying to myself, you know, I won't believe it until the judge say dismissed. I won't believe it. This time I didn't cry like I did the first time. I I, I had tears coming out my eyes that finally, 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 from the age of just turning 23 to 24, to the age of 50 years old, I, 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 I got this verdict overturned. And that was the first time that I felt that you know, justice was, was done. A lot of people are under a false impression that it's easy to obtain compensation for what you went through, for serving 26 years in prison for a murder you had proven you had not committed. But in fact, the law isn't so straightforward. And in your case, there was no automatic compensation and you had to fight pretty hard for it. Tell everyone sort of what that experience was like to fight for compensation and to live as a free man for the first time in 26 years without any compensation or protection from the government. I never went back to pick up my $40 in bus ticket money. Whatever I had in there, they could have. I never went back. 
That's how much I didn't care about what they gave me. They done made my life totally miserable to the best of their ability to pay not that compensation. If I didn't have what would come to hell law firm backing me, God knows how long that would have took. There's a lot of people that come out and don't receive a dime in certain counties, in certain states, and even in certain countries, which I feel is wrong, absolutely wrong. Because when I got out, the guys that were on parole had more benefits than I had. They were able to look for a job with the parole officer or whoever they assigned as their counselor to help them to find a job, to help them to find a place to live, to help them readjust themselves back to society. Whatever the circumstances may be that they needed me for, that's what the parole officer was supposed to do. Me, I had none of them rights. So I was completely on my own. I do not wish that on any person, on any person, because that's a bad situation to be in, especially if you don't have anybody. You talked about the struggle when you first got out of prison, just adjusting, even though there are a lot of resources that you could draw on personally, your education and some of the support that you had and your, your sort of personal resilience. Can you talk a little bit about adjusting to that? Well, first and foremost, <laughs> I want to explain a coincidence that happened to me one day when I was learning how to drive and I finally got past the test. And I made it to the what we call Poughkeepsie Galleria. Parked the car and I went inside. And when I went and I got something to eat, it was Chinese food. And I picked it up and then I went and I sat with my back up against the wall. And when I sat with my back up against the wall, I finally got hit with reality. I don't know where it came from, how it came. It just came. And the way it came was like, yo, man, what are you doing? And I got up and I went with all the tables that I sat in the middle and I started, I bust out laughing. And I know people must have thought I was crazy, but they didn't understand. I bust out laughing because I said, yo, man, I'm free. I'm really free. And this is like six months after I was home. And when I did that, it was like the, the best feeling I could have had because I finally realized I was free because I, I, at that time, I didn't know I was that institutionalized, mm -hmm. you know? for being in jail all that time, sitting in the corner, watching my back, you know, making sure no one could sneak up on me and do this and do that. And when I realized I was free and I sat out there, I sat in the middle of the floor. That was the completion of me saying, thank you, Lord. Thank you. I'm free, man. I'm <laughs> and boxing really, we haven't talked about it, but bo boxing was kind of a way back for you when you got out. Boxing helped me understand morals, obligation, responsibility, and discipline. Boxing helped me to actually be free, even while I'm in jail, because the anger, the pain, the hurt, the frustration, and everything that I had inside me, I can go work it out. If there's one thing that you want folks to take away from your story, our listeners today, or the kids who you speak to at the juvenile detention center, what is your message? Completely take control of your life. Don't be afraid to be your own person, male or female. Young or old. Don't be afraid to say to yourself, I want change, and then make a commitment. You know, and that's what boxing does for me. I'm not saying you have to deal with it through martial arts, you have to deal with it through boxing. I'm saying find that peace within inside of yourself that's going to actually make you feel better about your situation. And find the person that's about what you're about and get away from all the negativity. So you can put yourself in a better position. If you don't do that, then it's just a matter of time before you put yourself in a bad situation that you can't come out of. So my message is to tell people and explain to people that there's a better way. But your environment is the key to everything that you need to be to find out what you really want to do with your life. Dewey, I think that's a great message. And your courage has inspired so many people. ESPN learned about your story shortly after you were released from prison and awarded you the Arthur Ashe Award for Courage at the ESPY Awards because of the courage that you showed to stay true to who you are, to not admit to a crime that you didn't commit, even when it would have resulted in your immediate release from prison multiple times. That courage has just been so impactful on Shauna, on myself, on everybody at Wilmer Hale who has gotten to know you over the years. 
audiences literally around the world who you've spoken to at schools and churches, corporations. Your message is powerful and inspiring. And so we thank you for joining us on our podcast at Wilmer Hale to continue to spread that message and to continue to highlight the injustices that caused your wrongful incarceration and that unfortunately still require our attention and effort today. And also, I want to thank Shauna for joining us. It was just such a pleasure working with Shauna on your case and other cases for many, many years while she was at Wilmer Hale. And it's great to have her back and working with her again. Thanks, Ross. It's been great to connect with both of you and just echo what Ross said. Dewey, you're truly an inspiration and, and your courage has inspired me and everybody that you meet. So thank you. Thank you so much, Dewey, Ross, and Shauna. We continue to be inspired by this story and appreciate you sharing it with us and our listeners. Thank you everyone as well for joining us on this episode of In the Public Interest. If you enjoyed this podcast, please take a minute to share it with a friend and subscribe, rate, and review us wherever you get your podcasts. We hope you'll join us for our next episode. See you then.